Hello, everybody. Welcome to Marine Mammal Monday, Marine Mammal Goop. We are going full into spooky season here. So I'm bringing up all the gooey, gross wonderfulness that really makes our center thrive. Um, so if you are looking for Marine Mammal Monday, you are in the right place. We are here today to dive into spooky season, talk about some creepy crawlies with Marine Mammal Goop today. So happy October to everyone. I hope you are loving it already. And as you're coming in and joining us here, um, feel free to put in the comments where you're tuning in from. Um, and if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday, we love getting to see sort of how far our reach is going and who gets to come and visit. So thank you all so, so much for tuning in today for Marine Mammal Monday, Marine Mammal Goop. It's going to be a good goopy day today as we talk about all of the things um, mostly diagnostic side when it comes to caring for these marine mammals. I thought it'd be fun as we're diving into October and getting a little bit spooky season to think about the blood, mucus, and poop um, that really goes into um, our research, our diagnostics, and caring for the marine mammals here. So again, thank you all so much for joining me here today. I'm starting to see some folks mentioning in the comments. So if you're just joining us, feel free to put in the comments where you're tuning in from. And if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday, we love getting to see where folks are coming from. So I do want to say welcome to our folks that have mentioned that they're here so far. So welcome, Anita, coming in from Ronert Park. Excellent. Welcome, Lisa, all the way from Florida. I'm so glad that you are safe from Hurricane Ian. It was a really big one. We've got Marsha in from Auburn, Alabama. Welcome, welcome. We've got Carrie who is tuning in from Concord and excited about slime. Me too. Jeff from Temecula here in California. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Diane as well from San Simeon, who has been with us for many Marine Mammal Mondays. That's very exciting. Welcome to Kim from Albany. Um, Brad from San Mateo. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting. Thank you all so much for being here with me today as we dive into some marine mammal goop. Hello to Katie uh, from Calgary, Alberta. That's very exciting. Hello to Josephine, um, who's also Isabella and Sebastian from Los Gatos, California. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, Jenny from Florida. It's so nice to have you all here. I'm so excited for us to dive in to spooky season head first with Marine Mammal Monday and Marine Mammal Goop, aka the mucus, blood, and poop. <laughs> so we're diving into some of the glamorous work here at the center. Welcome to Cara from Davis and to Jim from Roswell, Roswell, New Mexico, excuse me. Um, but we will go ahead and get started here. Now, as we are getting started, if you're just joining us, welcome again to Marine Mammal Monday, Marine Mammal Goop edition. Um, feel free to continue to write in that chat box. We love getting to see where people are tuning in from and if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday but I'll go ahead and get us started. So since it is October and we are in spooky season, um, we do have our marine mammal pumpkin carving stencils that are back. Um, so I'm very, very excited to get to carve my own pumpkin. I hope that you enjoy that tradition as well. Um, talk about goop. Pumpkin carving, very goopy. Um, so definitely feel free to head to our website or Katie will put it into the chat links as well where you can download your own free marine mammal pumpkin carving stencil so that you can sort of represent the Marine Mammal Center from all over the place with some of these cute and amazingly well done um, pumpkin carving stencils. Excellent. Now, to start us off today, I would love to say hello to everybody. My name is Crystal Krusik, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Marine Mammal Center. And managing the comment box with me today is Katie, so we'll do our best to answer as many of those questions or comments as we can. Um, but if we don't get anything, uh, if we don't get to it live, we'll make sure that we get to it a little bit later. So thank you all again so much for joining Katie and I as we get started. Now, if you are new to 
uh, Marine Mammal Mondays or are not quite so sure who we are here at the Marine Mammal Center, I like to start with some level setting here um, to invite you all into our world. So the Marine Mammal Center is a global leader in marine mammal health, science, and conservation, and is the largest marine mammal hospital in the entire world. So here at the center, we are really, really working hard to try to think about how we can advance global ocean conservation. And we're doing this across about 600 miles of California coast and in Hawaii, where we have a secondary hospital location called Keikaiola. Now, all of this sounds like a lot, but we have a lot of support behind us. We are a nonprofit. So while we have a small but mighty staff here, we are really driven um, by the donation of time, love, energy of our volunteers that really make this happen along with our donors and our members as well. So thank you all to everybody. Um, if you are in some way connected to us and our work because you are what makes this happen. Now we have about 1,300 volunteers that really make, again, the work happen from all parts of the work that we do. So that's including the rescue, the rehab, the research, and eventually, again, our goal, that release. Now to dive into this a little bit further, all of this could not be possible without folks in the public, just like yourselves, giving us a phone call with our 24 hour hotline number that's right on top of the screen there, that's 415-289-SEAL. Anytime that you see something that's either a little bit off or that you're not so sure about, um, this is an excellent way that you can let us know that you're seeing something because even with over a thousand volunteers, 600 miles of California coast, is really hard to cover on our own. So we rely on folks just like you to let us know if you see an animal that's in distress or even something you're not sure about so that we can go in and investigate that with our group of trained volunteers. Now, if we decide that we are going to do a rescue, that way, excuse me, that's what you can see in this top left-hand picture there, is a rescue happening. So we'll have our trained volunteers go out with specific tools so that they can safely bring those animals from the beaches onto our hospital here in Sausalito, California. Now that's what you're seeing in that second picture there, just next to it, top right, um, is actually a picture of a sea otter getting an ultrasound. So part of that rehabilitation process, since we are a hospital, we can do basically anything you can do at a human hospital. So including things like ultrasounds, like x-rays, um, we even have a surgery suite here on site and we're really going to dive into some of the goop that we look at to make sure that we're giving our animals the best care possible. Now, during this time here, we're also doing lots of research, and that's what you're seeing that bottom left-hand photo is a picture into our lab that we're going to get pretty familiar with today. Now, this is really where a lot of that innovation comes in towards solving those global ocean conservation issues. Um, so this is where we're looking at trends that we can see, reasons why these animals are coming into our care and how we can innovate solutions um, that can affect more than just the animals in our care, but also their wild counterparts that may be affected by similar things. And then our ultimate goal, of course, is release, which you can see in that bottom right hand corner there. Some of our cute little um, harbor seals galumphing and belly bumping their way back out into their ocean home for that second chance at life. And then there's what I get to do, um, the educational component, um, which is how we're inviting folks just like you again to join in our work. So I hope you're all feeling inspired to join in. Make sure you write down that hotline number again. That's 415-289-SEAL. Um, but through this, you can be connected with our work from no matter where you are. So on our website, marinemammalcenter.org, we have tons of different activities, um, curriculum, um, all sorts of things that you can engage with from wherever you're located right now. So highly suggest checking that out. There's a lot of online learning resources there. Now, today within our care, we have about 33 patients. We've got about 22 California sea lions, four northern fur seals. We've still got one northern elephant seal. And we also have six Hawaiian monk seals in our care. So we've got about 33 patients in our care today. If you'd like to see the majority of them, um, our Sausalito site in California is open to the public. 
So feel free again to check our website for more information. That's going to be marinemammalcenter.org, um, where you can come on site and see some of these animals working hard to get better, to get rehabilitated, so that they can go back out to their ocean home. Now today we are diving into some spooky season goodness. So we are going to talk all about marine mammal goop, also known as blood mucus and poop. <laughs> so today we are going to dive right into that together. Now, all of this starts with our lab. Now, if you're unfamiliar, um, we've gone through a couple of different changes within our time here at the center. Um, and one really big change that we went through that just changed everything when it comes to goop was in 2009. So back in 2009, we went through a huge remodel at the center. And part of that remodel was the addition of an on-site lab. Now, in this clinical lab, this is really where a lot of that magic happens. Now, without this clinical lab and before 2009, what we used to do is we would collect all of these same samples that we do now. Um, however, if you're at all familiar with uh, human hospitals where they don't have an on-site lab, we can send out those samples to get processed elsewhere. Um, now, you might also be familiar that occasionally that can take one to two weeks for that processing to happen. Now, once we were able to have this lab on site, this clinical lab does such excellent work that now those samples are getting processed in as little as 24 to 48 hours. As you can imagine, now that we have those results even faster, that means that we can better care for these animals even more quickly. So that has been a huge, huge help to the care of these animals is to have this on-site lab where we can process all of these samples. Now you may be asking, I've said the word goop like 10,000 times already, what are we actually collecting and why? So to walk through some of those pieces of what we're collecting, um, I wanted to just give you a, a couple of visuals here. Um, so some of the things that we're collecting are going to be things like bacterial swabs. This can let us know about specific infectious agents that we might um, suspect that an animal has come into contact with. We'll do things like collect fecal samples or poop samples. And this is going to let us know if that animal might have things like parasites or some gastrointestinal distress. We'll collect things like urine um, that, again, can alert us to things like infection, um, but can also let us know more about things like kidney disease. We'll also collect blood, and we can learn so many different things from blood. So I'm going to outline a couple of the main things that we look at. One of them being um, the levels of blood urea nitrogen that can also show us things like kidney disease um, might be a good indicator of that. We'll look at the white blood cells that are present, um, and this can tell us about infection, maybe things like pneumonia, it can tell us about stress or even liver disease. There's a specific white blood cell called an eosinophil that we might also look for that can tell us about a parasitic infection or even an exposure to toxins when it's present. And of course, we'll also look at things like red blood cells, and that can tell us about um, if that animal is anemic, if they might have had some trauma, maybe they're dehydrated or malnourished. So through all of these different things and all of this different goop, we can learn a little bit more about these animals and their health. So on here, you can see a couple of different slides. Um, so if you were the one looking through that microscope, uh, the two that are on the left-hand side are both blood. So we can see some red blood cells and eosinophil. You can see in the center there um, that we've got a blood parasite. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that's actually a fecal swab. So we can look into the poop to see things like these larval, um, like these larvae <laughs> currently in the poop that are pictured. So to dive into this further, we're also going to talk about our top three patients, starting with number three. So I want to introduce you first to Rudder, our third most common patient as a Pacific Harbor seal. Now, Rudder um, came to us in 2019, but had a lot of really interesting specs on blood in particular. So we're going to explore blood a little bit more with Rudder here. Came to us with some puncture wounds and really malnourished. Was released actually even just one month later. So you'll see, wasn't in our care for too, too long. 
But Rudder um, was a really great example of the way that we look at blood. Now, through this, we were able to look at what Rudder had and compare it to some normals so that we could better learn what was going on because we saw puncture wounds, we saw malnutrition. Now, this is really extra important because sometimes things are going on with these animals that aren't visible, things that we can't actually see. Occasionally, we'll get some animals that are maybe entangled in ocean trash, and that's something that we know quickly what's wrong and quickly what we can care for. Um, however, with most of our patients, we're really going to have to take that look a little bit deeper to understand what's truly happening. So with Rudder, um, looking at blood, you could see that red blood cell count, that white blood cell count, and even some of that biochemistry. So Rudder came in at a pretty low, but not quite low enough to be considered very low blood cell when it comes to red blood cells. Um, some possible diagnoses when you're low and your red blood cells could be things like trauma or even anemia. And we did see, right, that he had those puncture wounds. That would be considered trauma. So his blood was helping to indicate that as well. When it comes to the white blood cell count, he was doing really well, um, but right on the line of almost a high white blood cell count. And so some possible diagnoses from there could be things like infection, pneumonia, or stress as well. And you can also see from his biochemistry all sorts of different things that we're looking at. So looking at things like glucose, phosphorus, potassium. And you can see from this that he's kind of all over the place in a lot of those different things. Now, what was really great is that we were able to care for Rudder and having these different metrics meant that we were able to care for Rudder even better, that we could go back and check those things in line with also checking other things like his weight over time since he came to us quite malnourished to sort of check and see how he's doing along the way to see if he's ready for that second chance at life. And after just about one month, Rudder was ready to go. He was released at Cypress Point. Um, and Rudder was out there um, in just about a month and actually had a huge, huge weight gain, which is awesome. So Rudder came to us with all of those issues like malnutrition and that trauma. Once the trauma healed and after lots of food and care and giving him that time to rest, he went from about 20 pounds to about 52 pounds on release. And keep in mind that was only about one month of time. Now, jumping into our second most common patient, our northern elephant seals, I'm going to dive into a different kind of goop. Now, our teen, a northern elephant seal, came to us this year on June 27th and again was with us for only about a month and was rescued for something called otostrongyliasis. Now, otostrongyliasis, are you ready for my spooky slide? <laughs> otostrongyliasis um, is actually a parasite. It's a lungworm parasite, um, but it's getting into the final host, which is what we saw with um, our teen, our elephant seal, um, through the food that he was eating. So it's processed in that host or in that elephant seal, and it's actually the larval stage is coming out in the feces. So this is where we get to talk about poop, everyone's favorite. So you can see on those that, that slide there that this has got that first stage larva in the feces. Now, after taking that, we can see a little bit more of what's going on as well because it will continually come out of that animal. So we're able to see and measure maybe something like the, the parasitic load in that animal based on things that we're seeing come out in the feces. Now, because it is found in fish and they're eating that, it's becoming this lungworm there. And so as they're eating that and that lungworm, that otostrongyliasis is developing and thriving in their bodies, what we tend to see as outward signs are pneumonia-like symptoms. So we see a lot of like almost like coughing happening. Um, it, it very much looks like pneumonia. Um, but if it becomes... Um, a parasitic overload, it can also do things like even block arteries and cause excessive bleeding in these animals. So it's important that we catch it early. So again, having that on-site lab means that we can process these samples, find what we need so that we're able to deliver the best care. So for something like this, 
We'll be giving them a lot of anti-parasitic medication, make sure that they get lots of rest and giving them that nice clean food. Because unfortunately with autostrongyliasis, what we see is the food that should be nourishing them is unfortunately making them ill. So luckily here at the center, they're able to sort of have a lot of that fresh, clean fish, that um, time to rest and to have those anti-parasitic medications so that we can get it out of their body and through their system. Excellent. Now I do want to take us to our most common patient here at the center, the California sea lion. Now I like to joke that they come in for basically everything under the sun, um, but plankton is a really great example of an animal that came into our care for something called leptospirosis. Now, plankton came to us, um, came um, from the Morrow Bay Harbor just this past um, year um, and came to us with malnutrition, so very thin, and also leptospirosis. Now, here's my next spooky slide. Um, leptospirosis is a spiral-shaped bacteria. Um, so that's what you're seeing all the way on the far left there that attacks the kidneys in particular. So that's what it's mostly affecting. Um, now what's really interesting with leptospirosis is that we see a couple of different things. One, that this is gonna be something we might need things like blood or urine to diagnose, right? Those are the goop that we're really focusing on here because it is gonna be present in those kidneys. So urine is gonna be great. That blood nitrogen, um, urea nitrogen level is gonna be another great way that we can see what's going on. Um, as we're diagnosing these animals, but it can be a little bit trickier to diagnose. So when you're out there, if you see animals kind of tucking, you can kind of see almost like a classic lepto tuck in that smaller picture there. Um, that tends to be what we see outwardly that gives us the thought that we maybe should be looking for something like leptospirosis. Now, because it is affecting their kidneys, oftentimes they're kind of huddled in almost like they have a stomach ache, that, that classic lepto tuck. Um, and what we also tend to see is that they get really, really thirsty since it is affecting their kidneys and they can't process liquids the way that they should be. Now, because these animals are all out in the ocean as they're drinking that water that's most available to them, that ocean water, it's very salty. So it actually tends to dehydrate them more than hydrate them. Now, typically, we don't see marine mammals drinking water at all. Um, in fact, that is a pretty good sign that there is something wrong. Most marine mammals um, will use metabolic water, meaning that they get all of the fresh water they need from processing the foods that they're eating. So that you're getting it mostly from their fish and other food items. They're able to process that down, get all of the water that they need to, to survive. So seeing any of them drink water is always a very weird sign to us as well. Now, the reason I also have a picture of all of those California sea lions together there is because of how this spreads. Now, leptospirosis, being a bacterial infection affecting the kidneys, is also spread through urine. So as you can see from this picture here, when they're on land, they are most susceptible. They're really jumping in together, being all in one space. Um, so through that, it's able to spread throughout the population. So from there, we can see that once one of them gets it, it's likely to spread and we can go through sort of outbreaks. And we tend to see outbreaks of leptospirosis about every three to five years or so, even though it is present in the environment. In fact, you might have heard of leptospirosis in, because this is something that you can vaccinate things like cats or dogs against as well. So if you have a fuzzy friend at home, make sure that you're again giving your distance from these wild animals because you never know what they might have that is also something that can pass to your fur babies or even yourself. Now, the good news is that we've got treatment down for this. So we know that we can flush it through their system. Since they are very thirsty, we can help by providing fresh water for them to drink. So that's what you're seeing in the form of that gray bucket there in the middle. On the right-hand side, you can see one of our amazing volunteers actually giving some subcutaneous fluids, again, to help give them all of the liquids that they need to support that kidney health. 
And the other thing is because it is a bacteria, we can give them some antibiotics. So we'll give lots of antibiotics to help make sure that we can fix this in their system so that we can help, again, support the kidney with lots of fluids, give them those antibiotics and get them out and on their way. So this is a picture of two sea lions. The one that's actually stealing the show here a little bit is Ratso. Um, but if you look a little behind Ratso, you'll see Plankton, the star of my show. Um, and Plankton here is getting ready for his release. You can see another picture of them here heading back out again to their second chance at life in that ocean home. So Ratso is really taking the lead here and Plankton being just behind. Now with all of that, um, I do also wanna talk about Hawaiian monk seals. And we've talked about a lot of goop so far in our top three patients, but my connection with Hawaiian monk seals I think is really special because we have been around for about 47 years as an institution. And that entire time doing things like collecting these samples, trying to understand what we're seeing out of them, comparing them to normals, really excelling in the care for these marine mammals, doing everything that we can for every single one. Now, through all of that research and the just development of all of these different samples and what that means when we're looking at the larger populations, we've been able to take all of that and really think about how we can apply some of the care that we use for our local species in California and apply it to the, uh, the United States' most endangered seal or sea lion, the Hawaiian monk seal. Now, since we've been able to work with them, we do have a um, satellite hospital out in Hawaii called Ke Kaiola, which means the healing sea. And that's where we get to really work with these animals, apply a lot of the research, apply a lot of the findings that we've come up with from having worked with all sorts of different animals, collecting all sorts of different kinds of goop and how we can apply it there. So I have a short video on how we can work not just to save the individuals, but also to save a species. Well, I work with the Hawaiian monk seals is really important because Hawaiian monk seals are critically endangered. There are only just over a thousand animals left. And there were three species, the Hawaiian monk seal, the Caribbean monk seal, and the Mediterranean monk seal. And the Caribbean monk seal has already gone extinct. The Mediterranean monk seal is now at about 400 animals. Currently, the Hawaiian monk seal is our sort of best chance of saving not just a species, but a genus as well. Uh. It helps that they're also charismatic, charming, fun animals with a sense of humor. Uh. So Big Kaiola is, is really our, our place on the big island at Kona, where we, where we treat the heel seals, we send them back out, I've worked at the Mural Center for you know, over 20 years and we spend a lot of time here, not just myself, but all the staff, the volunteers, everyone who comes here, working to save the lives of individual elephant seals, Pacific harbor seals, other fossils that are similar to Hawaiian monk seals but not endangered. So it's really fantastic to be able to take everything that we've learned from those animals to help an endangered species, but really we're not just saving individuals but we're also saving a population, a species, or a genus. Now, a couple of notes on that too, is actually that some of the numbers have gotten even better since this video was produced. Um, so uh, right now, Hawaiian monk seals are at about 1,500 in their population. So they have been doing really well, getting better and better each year, thanks to intervention from folks like NOAA, places like us that are able to care for these animals as they are getting sick. So they've been really, really special to work with. Now, when it comes to how we can all work together, um, you can also be an ocean hero. Now, some great things that you can do is if you happen to be in California or on Hawaii, we have hotlines for both places. Um, the hotline here stateside is 415 289 SEAL. And again, we need all the help that we can get when it comes to reporting sick or injured marine mammals. Um, because we cover those 600 miles from Mendocino County all the way down to San Luis Obispo in the south, we need your eyes and ears anytime that you're on these coastlines to let us know if you see anything suspicious or anything that might give you pause. 
another thing that we can all do is to share the shore. And believe it or not, this extends even past the shore. Um, that safe wildlife viewing is going to be really important. Um, so when it comes to marine mammals, we always say stay 50 feet away. Can kind of use our thumb trick. If you were to take your thumb, you should be able to fully cover that marine mammal with your thumb. And if you can't fully cover it, it means you're probably closer than 50 feet and need to take a few steps back. However, you can do the same thing anywhere you're in a wild or natural space. As you encounter wildlife, make sure that you keep yourself and your fur babies or anybody that you're with safe by giving those animals space. Um, we know that there are lots of diseases that can transfer from animal to animal and also animal to people. Things, again, like that leptospirosis. So being on the lookout, knowing what's in your surroundings and making sure we're giving wildlife enough space is an excellent way that you can also be an ocean hero. The last thing that I would always suggest is explore our website and learn more about the work that we do. I know I just kind of briefly touched on some of the diagnostic works that we do, but there's a lot of research that we're using this goop for as well. Um, so check out our website, marinemammalcenter.org. Explore in there. You can read all of our published works or links to those published works on our website. And you can dive into some of the work that we do there a little bit more. Support places that you care about. These research centers are really doing a lot of excellent work. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all so, so much for joining me here today as I got a little bit spooky and we dove into some uh, marine mammal goop talking about that blood, poop, and mucus, which was oh so fun. <laughs> so thank you all again so much for coming with me on this adventure to explore that marine mammal goop. If you liked this one, please come back to our next one. We have our next Marine Mammal Monday in November on November 7th. Same time, same place. Facebook and YouTube, feel free to join us as I talk about whales in San Francisco Bay. Um, so since it'll be November, I'll be thinking about our biggest eaters as I get ready to be my biggest eater for Thanksgiving. Um, so feel free to come and dive in with us as we explore the world of whales for our next Marine Mammal Monday for whales in San Francisco Bay. Thank you all again so much for coming. I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Happy spooky season!